and we should be live. Welcome everyone to the fifth installment in our webinar series titled Swedish Research in Cell Biology. Today we're very happy to host uh, Dr. Kirsty Spaulding from KI and her lecture, Adipocyte Function and the Metabolic Health in Humans. Uh, for those of you who are new to this, I would also like to just hint at uh, the fact that you can find similar events hosted by us uh, by also looking at our Twitter account, where we're called Swedish Cell Bio. So please find us there. Uh, today's agenda looks like this. Uh, I'm going to give a quick introduction to this event and uh, to my company that I represent, Mimid Tech. After that, we will have uh, Krista Rantanen from Baker Ruskin give uh, a little presentation of Baker Ruskin and upcoming events there. And then it's then finally time for the main big event, which is Kirsty's lecture. Follow, following Kirsty's lecture, there will be a live Q and A, uh, and. Uh, when we're done with this, I will also present our next lecture coming up in February. So the Q&A, uh, we will take that as it goes, but most probably we will say on the platform. If not, then we'll share a link with you where you can go and follow. So we'll be able to discuss in real life. The company then, Milmed Tech AB is a Swedish distributor uh, located in south of Sweden. And we supply, maintain, and install simple to advanced laboratory equipment. And we're then the Swedish general agent to several leading manufacturers worldwide. So if you have any technological demands or issues, always you're always free to contact us, of course. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, adipocytes. And uh, then I thought a little bit about uh, adipocyte cells and tissue culturing and what we can offer in terms of that. Well, I'm a firm, believe, firm believer uh, in the fact that physiologically relevant results arise from physiologically relevant culturing conditions, such as in an in vivo 400 from Baker Ruskin. Uh, they will be able to create an optimal and simulate in vivo conditions for your cells. Uh, you will be able to control precisely temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. And these also come with internal HEPA filtration as a standard. Perfect if you, for example, are culturing adipocyte cells and tissues. Uh, some suggested reading for you all. I'm, uh, this is something I would like to include henceforth. Uh, and here is a editorial from the International Journal of Obesity. Uh, published this year, and uh, there's a quote here that uh, I would like to read to you before we move on. Uh, Thus, experiments in primary human adipocytes, myocytes, and hepatocytes that are cultured under different oxygen levels, mimicking the local tissue microenvironment, will reveal for, uh, whether and how perturbations in tissue oxygenation will affect the metabolic and or the inflammatory phenotype. This paper says that there's still quite a lot of things to be investigated in depth. And uh, one tool that could be helped is then, of course, a workstation that allow you to control the oxygen concentration. All right, so that was uh, just a little short introduction to us, what we do, and uh, an example of the products and services we can provide. I'm now going to hand over the torch to uh, uh, Dr. Krista Rantanen at the Baker Ruskin, the, uh, who's joining us here on the screen. Hey, hey, Daniel, thank you. Can you pull up my slides, please? Yes, hi from my side as well. So my name is Krista Rantanen, and I'm the Director of Scientific Applications here at Baker and Baker Ruskin. So um, like you saw, we have all those nice uh, Physoxia, hypoxia tools from Baker Ruskin. Uh, but from as you can see in this slide, Baker Ruskin is just one part of this uh, set of companies that's under the umbrella of Baker. Um, so, in fact, um, we are uh, very experienced in also biological safety cabinets as well as in these hypoxic workstations. So, 
first of all, um, Baker, which is located in, in Sanford, Maine, um, um, brought first biological safety cabinets in the market in 1948, so quite a while ago. And then uh, Baker Ruskin from UK, uh, located in Bridge End, uh, is the manufacturer of hypoxia workstations. And then we also have Cleaner by Baker in the Netherlands and has been in business uh, quite a while also. So we have truly uh, quite, uh, quite a lot of experience in, in this field of biocontainment. So should you ever need any of those products, feel free to um, contact us for those. Uh, but what I'm here for today is to actually talk about um, some scientific events that we have also in addition to this great um, series of lectures by Milmetak in Sweden, we have Hypox EU. So I would um, like if all of you would uh, take a look at hypoxeu.com. Um, so this is an international forum where we invite people. We uh, it's an open forum online happening now. Um, we have quarterly events. We just had one on the 9th. So that was our last week, Thursday. <laughs> uh, and, and what we try to do through Hypox EU, so it's truly a science for science event. So even though we as a company are supporting the infrastructure of Hypox EU, this is a scientific initiative to um, um, network and, and uh, uh, communicate with, with scientists and, and get scientists to communicate uh, with each other, especially in the field of hypoxia and oxygen biology. So the concept is that we have, like said, quarterly lectures, short ones presented by younger members of the scientific community from maybe name labs, but they are nevertheless the younger generation and presenting their work. So, so that's the forum. And I truly hope that I'm going to see all of you there. Um, and to make this even more interesting, we are planning towards the end of 2022, have a live event in Dublin, so, so that's going to be great. Um, it's not only um, uh, Baker Ruskin who's organizing this, we do have a scientific organizing committee and some of these names I'm sure are very familiar to you. Uh, Roland Wenger, Randall Johnson from KI actually, Chris Pugh, uh, Cormac Taylor, Dote Kaczynski, Eruna Berra, and then two ladies from Finland, Johanna uh, Mylluharju and Beppi Karppinen. And so this is the scientific organization committee who's behind Hypox EU. Another thing that I want to present to you, well, this is just for you to take note, like I said, next one in, in March. Um, this is something that I also want you to check out. So as you are interested in oxygen biology and hypoxia, so this is a Twitter account that you might want to um, take a look at. So under Dr. Ox, so Essentially, that's me, but I'll be posting every single day, including Christmas Eve. I will post something about the scientific topics we are also interested about. So go and follow that one. And we also have a LinkedIn group called Supporting Science. So a lot of things for you to get involved with. And yeah, so that's um, actually, it wasn't everything from me. I see that there's one more slide. Um, also uh, having to do with Dr. Ark's character on Twitter. What I do there, I also have this uh, series called Unexpected Questions. And in this series, I interview uh, the topmost scientists of the world. So here in the, in the picture is, of course, Professor Celeste Simon from the University of Pennsylvania. A very uh, prominent hypoxia researcher. So should you want to hear what they feel about not only science, but life and, and you know, general stuff and go and see these videos. They are quite entertaining, I promise you. Okay, so that's all from me. And now to do the highlight of the day. So Kirsty, the floor is yours. Thank you. think let's see okay is that working if i change oh thanks daniel okay uh firstly thank you very much um to the organizers for inviting me it's lovely to have the opportunity to discuss some work that we were working along for a long time but recently sort of 
put together as a first story. And uh, this is very much uh, looking at what happens to fat cells in obesity and how could that be contributing to, to the pathology or the comorbidity surrounding obesity. So I'm going to start just to point out in my opening slide, just to pay attention to the, the, um, the architecture of fat cells. And I, I think most people that have logged on here are somewhat in the field, so maybe this is um, redundant, but coming from a neuroscience background, I think you know, it's quite striking. These fat cells are, here we have with lectin, a red, uh, shown in red here, you can see the membrane stain. And the nuclei are just squashed right up against the end of the, the, the side of the cell as the cell is dominated by this giant unilocular lipid droplet, at least in white adipocytes. And they can increase in size up to 200 fold in volume in the lifespan of a fat cell, which I think is quite remarkable. And sort of in obesity, this is what we tend to see happen. We get an increase in the size of the fat cells. And this can also be accompanied by hyperplasia, which is a recruitment of new fat cells. But we have also shown in previous work that I'm not discussing at all here that we actually make new fat cells every year, around 10% new fat cells. And the dogma in the field has pretty much um, dominated that this is how it goes. You have tissue resident progenitor cells, these pre adipocytes, which proliferate as needed and then differentiate it as, as needed to become slightly filling with um, lipid droplets to become uh, adipocytes, in which case they then uh, terminally exit cell cycle and differentiate to become mature fat cells. And this has sort of always been accepted that, that the fat cell has a proliferative stage as a progenitor and then once it's a terminally differentiated fat cell, it's exited cell cycle and it's no longer active in cell cycle. We had an interesting observation in the group going back quite a few years now where a master's student noticed that um, in human adipocytes that have been freshly isolated from abdominal subcutaneous adipose biopsies, she noticed that some fat cells had two nuclei. And you can see this here, the nuclei indicated in blue. And we spent a long time rather laboriously confirming that this was a true event because sometimes when you isolate adipocyte, cells burst and you can have nuclei sticking on the outside. So we really sort of did a lot of confocal microscopy and different staining to really convince ourselves that this was the case. And this prompted us to dig a little bit deeper into understanding what cellular programs are associated with obesity and hyperinsulinemia. Hyper and this was driven by the fact that these binucleated cells that we saw and counted scaled with the patient parameters. So the more obese and hyperinsulinemic a patient was, the more of these cells that they had. And also there were different amounts in different depots. So this didn't feel like a random event, but nor was it really in line with what we understood about um, you know, the, the cell cycle status of fat cells. So we spent quite a while thinking intriguingly that maybe we were, uh, adipocytes were able to divide. And I say we fast forward three years or so because a lot of work by Carolina and, and Shen in the group concluded that we really don't believe that that's what's happening. And instead, that was more the tip of the iceberg. And so today I will present the rest of the iceberg, which was the follow up work. But I felt to at least acknowledge the years of work that uh, that these people put in before the before I get to the story that we're now going to tell you. But I would like to very much acknowledge up front. Um, Carolina Hargberry, who was a postdoc in my group. She's now left and has her own independent group at um, the Department of Medicine, Solna and Karolinska. And Shen Li was a PhD student in, in, in the lab and she has since left to take up a position in China. But the two of them worked for many years um, together, really, really pushing this project and, and producing a lot of the data that I will show today. So our first um, approach to investigate was to investigate the cellular programs that were associated with obesity and hyperinsulinemia. And so to do that, we took adipose tissue biopsies from a range of individuals, um, lean, obese, obese with normal insulin, obese, hyperinsulinemic. We excluded from this study all diabetics, type 1 and type 2 diabetics, um, and those on medications. And we isolated the adipose tissue. Uh, we separated out the mature adipocytes and we 
performed RNA sequencing on these adipocytes or we fixed and stained for downstream analysis. And when we did um, look at the bulk sequencing data for these different patient cohorts, we looked at the top 10 enriched pathways for genes differentially expressed in the obese hyperinsulinemic individuals. And we were not so surprised because of the binucleator, but still pleasantly sort of surprised and encouraged that cell cycle was really coming up. Um, uh, transcription, cell cycle, notch signaling, we were really seeing pathways indicating that something was going on uh, cell cycle with these mature human adipocytes. So we then, um, Carolina then collected transcripts known to associate to different stages in the cell cycle. And we had a look at the expression of these transcripts across different patient cohorts. So we had three lean individuals, six individuals who are obese with normal insulin levels and uh, four individuals that were obese and hyperinsulinemic. And if you look at this heat map, there's a few points. It's a busy slide. It's a lot of data, and it's definitely not going to work, walk through all, all these, um, all these uh, genes. But it was, you can clearly see that for a cell type that's supposedly post-mitotic, there was a lot of red dots. So there's a lot of transcripts for different stages of cell cycle expressed in these freshly isolated mature fat cells. You can then notice that there's sort of a bit of a trend. So what we saw was that the lean individuals predominantly had a transcript profile of being in quiescence and early G1. In obesity, this became more speckled and there seemed to be quite a mixture of different cell cycle stages. And in the obese hyperinsulinemic, there seemed to be an accumulation um, of G2 transcripts, sort of uh, indicating that the adipocytes were stalled in, in the G2 stage of cell cycle. And lastly, and, and most strikingly was the almost complete absence of markers of mitosis at a transcript level. So we then wanted to see whether or not this transcript data um, translated into protein data. And so we did immunohistochemistry and immunocytochemistry on adipocytes freshly isolated from subcutaneous adipose tissue biopsies. And you can see here in a close up, we look at the proliferation marker KI67 and we, would, we confirmed and quantitated the amount um, of positive cells using confocal microscopy where we did complete adipocyte stacks and quantified with lectin to really ensure that the nuclei and the staining was within the cell. And you can see here clearly KI67 positive nuclei in an adipocyte. We looked at uh, two proliferation markers, proliferating cell nuclear antigen and KI67. We also looked at a number of different cell cycle markers. I show here just cycling D1 and A2, but we also did um, E1 and phosphistone H3 and some others that, that I'm happy to discuss, but you can see them here. So you can see if we just take the zoom in of the nucleus, you can clearly see within the focal plane um, evidence of both negative and positive adipocytes for all the proliferation markers and cell cycle markers. And just to ensure that this wasn't some artifact of the isolation procedure and the collagenase treatment. We also did this with um, tissue sections and immunohistochemistry. And we, we show again here, and we could clearly see evidence for um, all the cell cycle and proliferation markers being positive in adipocytes. So then we quantified this. And in this plot here, every dot, square, triangle, et cetera, is one individual. So what you can see here is in for each individual, the percentage of cells that were positive for the different cell cycle markers. And you can see a, a decrease for cyclone A2 and phosphistone H3, which is as we would expect since these are more um, G2 restricted, uh, sorry, G2 restricted uh, marker and um, uh, S phase G2 M phase marker. So they're, they're not, there is a more, they're expressed in a more restricted stage of cell cycle compared to cyclone D1 and E1 with D1 coming on at the beginning of cell cycle and E1 expressed throughout cell cycle. And so you can see that there are a lot of individuals that had expression of these cell cycle markers in their mature adipocytes. But I think even more striking than the number uh, that, 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 that there was a large expression is the heterogeneity. So say for example, with cyclin D1, some individuals had nearly all their cells expressing cyclin D1 and some had nearly none. And there was a huge range amongst people. So we were interested in understanding better what was driving this heterogeneity. 
And so we looked at a number of patient clinical parameters and I show just the ones that were significant here. But you can see that, that we saw a significant correlation between insulin measurements. And here we show C-peptide and homo-insulin resistance values, but also we looked at serum insulin values and that was also significantly correlated. And adiposity. And here we show fat mass and BMI, but we also have the same significance for um, percent body fat. Um, and here we saw no correlation between age and every other clinical parameter investigated, actually. So it was really adiposity and insulinemia that was correlating such that an increase in um, insulin, uh, hyperinsulinemia, you got more cells becoming positive for cyclin D1, cyclin A2, phosphostatin H3, and this trend was also seen as one increases in adiposity, increases in fat mass, increase in BMI. So since many of these factors interact with each other, we did a multiple regression analysis to really see if we could determine the factors that were really um, associating with uh, the mature adipocytes going into cell cycle. And you can see here from this, this plot, anything that crosses the zero line is not significant. And so you can see in the adjusted values where you adjust for all the different predictors that really fat mass was the, the um, only factor that significantly associated with cell cycle progression. And, and we looked at cyclin A2 as a marker of adipocytes that had gone through S phase. You can see, though, that there was a very wide confidence interval with the C-peptide, the measurement of, of um, uh, hyperinsulinemia. And we were interested because we also noticed, and if you remember in the heat map that I showed you, we saw that in, a, in the obese individuals, there was a progression or, or increase in, in transcript expression for the cell cycle stages. But in the obese hyperinsulinemic, then they seemed to be more um, restricted into G2 phase. So it seemed that the hyperinsulinemia was even further pushing them through cell cycle. So to investigate uh, insulinemia a little bit more, we then went to a more controlled setup and we went to an in vitro situation where we isolated adipose tissue again from a, um, different cohorts of individuals. And we collected either adipose tissue for explant cultures or we isolated the adipocytes um, for single cell cultures. And we incubated the cells with EDU which is a thymidine analog and is incorporated during S phase. So we were able to have a readout of adipocytes that were actively synthesizing DNA. And you can see in both the adipose tissue explant and in the isolated adipocytes that there are clearly EDU labeled cells and EDU negative cells. So we can clearly see that adipocytes um, in vitro were able to go through S phase as a mature intact adipocyte and synthesize new DNA. We then isolated these adipocytes and cultured them uh, with, with EDU and with and without insulin. And you can see here that in the basal state, the, the adipocytes are still able to go through S phase, but this, this was um, significantly uh, augmented when they were treated with insulin. And this is after four days of culture with insulin. Uh, in, in the converse situation, we could see that if we cultured the adipocytes with charcoal-treated FPS, so this was deleting the, um, depleting the FPS of insulin and growth factors, we were able to really attenuate the uh, ability of adipocytes to go through cell cycle. And if we looked at nuclear size and we compared those treated with insulin and those without insulin, we saw that those treated with insulin were significantly bigger than nuclear size. So we showed that insulin was able to push cells through cell cycle, able to go through S phase, synthesize DNA, and the nuclei were larger in size. And this is also shown when we compare the size, the nuclear size of those that were EDU positive versus EDU negative, that again, the EDU positive were significantly bigger. We then took the, the, the cells and we used flow cytometry to assess the content, the nuclear content of DNA. And you can see here using DAPI as a nuclear dye that we saw that with insulin, we were able to significantly increase the amount of um, nuclei with more DNA. And this was confirmed as well with EDU analysis. So it's 
pretty well established and known that as BMI increases, fat cell size on average increases, and this is our patient cohort. Each dot is an individual, show, individual of different BMI showing the average fat cell size. But it's, it was not known um, what happens to nuclear size. And so we showed that as cell size increase, nuclear size also significantly increases. And so we did um, image cytometry. So these were adipocytes freshly isolated from subcutaneous abdominal depot from two lean individuals and four obese individuals. And we used image cytometry to determine the nuclear DNA content of these nuclei. And you can see here that there was on average more DNA in the nuclei from the adipocytes in the obese individuals compared to the lean. And this is just visualizing it as um, DNA quantity as measured by integrated density uh, in the lean compared to the obese. So we had evidence at this point that we were seeing that adipocytes were activating a transcriptional program, but at all stages of, of cell cycle, but we didn't see any evidence of mitosis. We see in vitro that we can stimulate adipocytes to enter into cell cycle, synthesize um, DNA, and you get a concomitant increase in nuclear size. And in the beginning, I told you we spent a lot of time thinking that maybe that um, adipocytes were dividing, which seemed tricky given the nature of them with these giant lipidroplet. But the more we looked, um, the more we recognized that they really, we didn't believe they were undergoing mitosis. And so rather than a mitotic cell cycle, which is characterized by um, G1, DNA synthesis, G2, and mitosis, we believe that adipocytes were activating an endoreplication program. So endoreplication sort of has two um, channels in which it can work, and one endomitosis, which cells go through G1 phase, DNA synthesis, G2, and then they enter into mitosis, but they fail to undergo cytokinesis. So they end up with two nuclei, and then they exit. And this fit with the binucleated data that we had seen at the very beginning, which sort of initiated this study. Uh, and another program is endocycling. And this is where cells don't enter into M phase at all. They just go through growth phase, DNA synthesis phase, growth, so they rotate this way. And so we looked a little bit more into endoreplication, re endo and it's really a program that multiple cell types actually use as a way to cope with increases in, in um, cell size and the demands associated with that. And this is a study not produced by, our, by, our, by us, but others that have looked at the volume of fat cells of various different cell types and the DNA concentration. And you can see here that in megakaryocytes and in cardiomyocytes and hepatocytes, these are all known polyploid cells that are known to endoreplicate. Adipocytes are like over here somewhere on this size scale. And they had not really ever been investigated for how they might cope with getting extremely big and whether endoreplication might be a process that they utilize. But if you see here, this is representative of sort of normal size cells, uh, proliferal blood mononuclear cell nuclei. And these are adipocyte nuclei. This is from a lean individual, and this is from an obese individual. And these cells can get extremely big. And we saw a strong association that as serum insulin in the patient increased, so did nuclear volume. And as I mentioned, this sort of increase, many cell types go through these rounds of endoreplication as a way to, to cope. Hepatocytes and megakaryocytes um, deal, deal with increases in, in size in, in going through this uh, endoreplication. Tropho, trophoblast giant cells and drosophila uh, fat body. Interestingly, sort of the analog in the drosophila and the C. elegans for adipose tissue, they undergo that so that they have better nutrient transport and nutrient storage. So we really believe that the cell cycle activation of cell cycle and the endoreplication we were seeing in the adipocytes could confer some sort of adaptive advantage to adipocytes um, as we see really severe increase for adipocytes to really have significant increases in cell size across their lifespan and particularly with weight gain. So in summary of this part of the talk, we showed that obesity and hyperinsulemia are drivers for increased cell size and nuclear size in adult human adipocytes, that insulin treatment in vitro promoted cell cycle progression 
and this was concomitant with an increase in nuclear size and DNA content. We then looked at what happened. So when we were treating with insulin and we, we saw an increase in adipocytes that were, able to, that were responding to insulin and going through DNA synthesis, we then looked at this as a function of the patient parameter. And so this was a fat mass uh, of the individual, and this is the percent of cells that went through S phase. Um, and you could see here that the, in the basal condition, so without insulin stimulation, as fat mass increased, the percentage of cells that incorporate EDU increased. So the percentage of cells that are going through S phase increased. When we looked at the fold change, when we treated with insulin, we then saw that with C peptide, so as the, with hyperinsulinemia, that the, the the fold change in the in the percent of cells that that synthesized DNA actually significantly decreased. So this could be the increased proportion of adipocytes. This could this decrease sort of in the responsiveness to insulin in the obese hyperinsulinemic individuals could be that there's an increased proportion of adipocytes stored in G2 phase, which was what we saw in the transcript data when we did the heat map, that we actually saw that most of the um, adipocytes in the obese hyperinsulinemic individuals were sort of stalled in this G2 phase. But alternatively, it could be that there was a blunted response to insulin, that hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, that the cells were not as capable to respond to insulin and drive activation of the cell cycle. So to investigate this, we took adipocytes from two lean individuals, um, sorry, one lean individual, two uh, obese normal insulin level individuals, and two obese hyperinsulinemic individuals, and we acutely treated them with insulin to gauge their the um, insulin signaling pathway response. And we have more Western blot data, but I tried to minimize the amount of blot, blots I put in this page. And whilst you can see clear evidence of insulin resistance in the obese hyperinsulinemic adipocytes. Um, you can see that here with the downregulation of, of GLUT4, but also we saw downregulation of IRS1 and insulin receptor. But you can see a very robust response to insulin still, with the plus representing insulin in, in terms of phospho-AKT. So you can see it clearly here that the, the adipocytes from these obese hyperinsulinemic individuals are still very able to respond to insulin despite insulin resistant status. We did interestingly see, and this was in line with the cell cycle data, that we saw a robust induction and increase in cell cycle markers in the obese uh, individuals, hyperinsulinemic individuals. This was a result that was always perplexing to us because we did this quantification in the early part of the project. And whilst we had seen sort of a robust increase in the, the, the expression of many of the cell cycle markers, we saw a very significant decrease in proliferation markers. And this is shown here with KI67 and PCNA. And each dot is an individual showing the percent of cells positive for these proliferation markers. And you can see here a very significant negative correlation such that the higher the fat mass of the individual, the lower the proliferation markers. And this kind of was juxtaposing with the cell cycle data that was showing that we saw an increase in expression of cell cycle markers. And yet we saw this decrease in proliferation markers. So then we thought that, that this, going back to this initial heat map that I showed you at the beginning, where we looked at in the obese hyperinsulinemic individuals, we saw that there was a majority of adipocytes that were seemed to be stalled in G2. So then we thought that perhaps what's happening is you, the cells get pushed through cell cycle, in which case uh, then in G2, then they exit the cell cycle. And KO67 and PCNA um, decrease is uh, a classic marker of cell cycle exit. So we then went back to our sequencing data and looked at what are all the pathways that associate with high cyclin D1, which increased with um, obesity and hyperinsulinemia. And interestingly enough, we saw one of the top hits coming up was senescence and DNA damage. And now I'm sure everyone's heard about senescence and it is everywhere. But when we started this study, senescence was still a relatively, at least uh, outside of the aging field, it was not something that we were really discussing or thinking about. 
So we were quite intrigued by this and we dug into it and we looked in a targeted approach at a number of transcripts that have been known to be markers upregulated in senescent cells, as well as some markers that are known to be downregulated in senescent cells. And then we also looked at markers that were representative of what's called the SASP. So this is a senescence associated secreted factors. And these are factors that are known to be um, secreted by senescent cells that have an impact on creating a pro-inflammatory or fibrotic state. And so again, we separated into our cohort with the three lean, the six obese normal insulin, the four obese hyperinsulinemic. And it was quite striking that we really saw um, at a transcriptional level, a very senescent profile in our obese hyperinsulinemic individuals, as well as a robust transcriptional profile for the SASP, for these secreted factors. So we then went on to confirm senescence using an assay, and this we use one of the more classically used assays, a senescence-associated beta-galactosidase assay. And it seems to have been a little bit color distorted in my saving to PDF, but essentially it's like almost like this one has summed up all the colors of this. These were all quite green <laughs> and you got less green and green sort of being an ind indication of a senescent positive cell. So in these isolated adi ad adipocytes that you're seeing at the bottom of these Eppendorfs here. Uh, Kirsty, I'll just uh, <coughs> a comment. Mm -hmm. um, with the current um, um, mouse marker setting, we cannot see what you're pointing at. Oh, okay. Uh, so Thanks. you could do... I've been pointing away the whole <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry um so when you click uh, the mouse marker symbol here in the settings you can uh, I think there's an option there where you can have a not go from private pointer to pointer how do I I've clicked on it can you see the now, pointer? yes now we can see it and oh, I'll thank hide you. away again Sorry, I've been busy pointing at everything all the way through the talk, but hopefully you followed anyway. Yeah, I don't know why I'm saying this one here seems to have just become exaggeratedly green, but you can see as if you want to look at the um, the published work, these are all actually quite green. This is not crazy green, but you can see a sort of a definite progression that we see almost no evidence of senescence in the non-obese individuals, and it was graded and increased in the obese hyperinsulinemic individuals. And we then took a different cohort of individuals. So this was um, four individuals in each of the patient categories. But we then did a number, another cohort where we actually quantified individually, counted the number of fat cells that were positive for this senescence-associated beta-galactosidase staining. And this is quantified down here. And you can see the percent of the, the SABG positive cells in the people without obesity obese but normal insulin and obese hyperinsulin and i think it's quite obvious and, and striking that really in the obese hyperinsulinemic you see an increase in the senescence profile and again because many of these factors uh, interact with each other we went for a multiple regression analysis and it was extremely robust that really insulin and it was true for all insulin parameters we looked at c-peptide homa ir serum insulin they really significantly um, associated with the levels of senescence in the mature human adipocytes. So then we looked at other markers of senescence, um, DNA damage response and P16, which is a CDK4 um, and CDK6 inhibitor. So this is kind of like the break in the cell cycle that gets activated in senescent cells. I'd like to put out there that senescence, unfortunately, does not have a definitive marker. So you can't look for one marker and say 100% this is senescent. So really, you sort of have to come at it from multiple angles and um, see that your senescent cell fits into the category of many of these. And SABG is a major marker commonly used. P16 and P21, the CDK4-6 inhibitors, are two others. Gamma H2AX, indicative of a DNA damage response. Um, so we looked at this and some other parameters I, I haven't presented today, but you can clearly see that the percentage of adipocytes positive for P16 increased uh, as patient hyperinsulin uh, levels increased. So as a patient became more hyperinsulinemic, you got more P16 positive adipocytes. And this was really a function of the insulin profile of the, the patient, not BMI. And in contrast, we saw a very significant correlation with the DNA damage response, the gamma H2AX, as a function of BMI. 
And this was a little bit as we expected, since others have shown that in obesity, you get increased um, oxidative damage, reacts to oxygen species, and you get increased um, DNA damage in gamma H2AX in adipocytes in obesity. So we just showed sort of at a quantitative single cell level that we also saw this, and it was not dependent on serum insulin, but it was dependent on adiposity. So then we looked at a number of the factors that are secreted by senescent fat cells, and this is obviously the transcript data where you can see in, uh, quite a um, enrichment for um, transcripts for these senescence-associated secreted factors in the obese hyperinsulinemic individuals. And we confirmed this data for a number of these um, transcripts with qPCR. And again, you can see robust um, increase uh, in transcript expression in a number of these SASPs. And so to summarize this part, um, and there's only one part left if it sounds like it's going on, um, mature human adipocytes can activate a cell cycle program and they can senesce in response to hyperinsulinemia. And the senescence-associated secretory profile suggests that senescent adipocytes are contributing to chronic low-grade inflammation in the obese hyperinsulinemic state. So our model that we propose is that, and, and um, I really like this, another scientist coined the metaphor, the um, Blagoskini, he came up with the, the car analogy, if you were with the accelerator and the brake. And so he, he claims that sort of a cell that come, becomes compromised, so they've got a constant accelerator on it, and at the same time it's got a brake, and the cell will be stalled for a while until it then exits into a senescent state. And so we believe in our case that insulin is acting as a mitogenic signal, therefore the accelerator, and that cellular stress such as DNA damage or other cellular stresses are acting as a break. And so sort of combined with this, you will get the cells um, with cellular stress exiting into a senescent state shown here in this bluey green color. So therefore, if we increase the accelerator and we do this by culturing with insulin, so we increase the mitogenic signal, we should therefore be able to increase the amount of senescent cells. If we increase the insulin, but at the same time we increase the break, and we, we um, tested this by giving the CDK4-6 inhibitor palbociclib, so in a way kind of like mimicking the internal expression of P16 or P21, we would therefore further increase senescence. And then lastly, we hypothesized that if we stop the cells from entering and activating a cell cycle program, that we would be able to block cells from becoming senescent. So we, this is what we did. So with insulin, we cultured with insulin and we did prolonged insulin. And you can see culturing from four days or seven days, the, the chronic the, uh, exposure to insulin significantly increased senescence in these fat cells. And just to check that this was not just simply because cells were in culture for longer, we also um, cultured for seven days under basal and with extra insulin. 100 nanomolar insulin, and you can see here that we significantly uh, increased the percentage of senescent adipocytes. We confirmed using another senescent marker, P16, so we also saw that insulin drove senescence using the P16 marker. Whilst we didn't see significance at the time course during, and especially since we looked for lots and lots of um, proteins, and you, you do a multiple testing um, uh, correction at the end, the significance was was minimal, but you could definitely see a trend. Uh, and and sorry for for some factors, this was looking at these um, senescence associated factors secreted into the into the condition into the media after culturing these adipocytes, and you can see a significant increase in the secretion of a number of these SASPs, and certainly a trend for most of these um, factors to be increased. So then the opposite, that was increasing the accelerator. When we also increased the brake by giving palbociclib, you could see that we um, stopped cells from progressing through cell cycle as evidenced by the decrease in EDU. Um, C cyclin D1, which can be a marker of senescence in cell cycle, active cell cycle was unchanged. Uh, we saw an increase, significant increase in senescence. And whilst largely not significant um, at this time course, you could definitely see a trend for palbociclib shown in red here to increase the um, secretion of senescent factors. 
And lastly, when we block cell cycles, we use metformin, which is upstream and blocking the cells from, from activating a cell cycle program. This was evidenced by nearly all cells, not at all entering into S phase, um, this quite robust blocking of, of cell cycle progression, decrease in cyclin D1, and a significant decrease in almost abolishing senescence. And that's also evidenced here by pretty much um, blocking the secretion of most senescence associated factors. So to summarize in this, we, we, we believe that the model is that you have the insulin that's driving cell cycle activation, you have internal stress that is causing cells to exit into senescence. And if you have a hyperinsulinic state, you have increase in um, the accelerator. And if you have a, um, say, obesity state and a DNA damage response, you sort of increase the internal break. And both of these factors combined drive so that you get an increase in senescence in the obese hyperinsulinic individuals. Oh, I think I just said this slide. So we believe that adipocytes are, are largely um, in the, the, the post-mitotic or quiescent state, and then insulin can drive them to reactivate a cell cycle program evidenced by, micro, by proliferation cell markers and cell cycle markers, but that in a stressful environment and in a chronic hyperinsulinic state that you can instead push adipocytes to activate a mitogenic program, which can result in, uh, in the, the pathological state of senescence. So lastly, I would just like to acknowledge that this was a project that was run over many years and, and I there was some, you know, really fabulous collaborators and workers on this project. I firstly acknowledge Carolina and Shen, who really drove this project. They had some excellent support from Helena de Silva Cascales, who did a lot of the cell cycle work. Um, and, and they had Furutse and Ping, who's not shown here, that did fabulous job with all the um, transcript work and the sequencing work. Maria, extremely talented technician in the lab, was extremely helpful. And Lena, the lab manager who does handling all of the adipose work. And Shui, who hates being mentioned, but Shui Lang um, was a technician in the group who really carried the rebuttal and did so many additional experiments. So he did a fabulous job, as well as Niels Kramer, who is a PhD student in the, grab, in the lab who did a lot of the computational work. So I would like to thank all those involved and also everyone for your attention. I will just leave the funding acknowledgements definitely last but not least. Thank you. All right, and thank you, Kirsty, for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, extremely fascinating. Um, <clears throat> we're going to open up for Q and A, but I'm thinking that I will just take a moment to introduce our next event prior to that, uh, because then I will be able to end the recording. We can open up. Um, open up uh, for everyone to um, use their cameras and microphones and have a little bit of a discussion here regarding uh, Kirsty's work. And of course, you have not agreed to uh, uh, be filmed that way. So uh, next event that we're going to have is going to be in February. And then we're going into the field of developmental biology instead with uh, the lecture Reconstructing uh, WNT Signaling a pathway at the interface between development and cancer by Associate Professor Claudio Cantu at uh, Linköpings University here in Sweden. Uh, save the date, the 9th of February, uh, same time as uh, this, we tend to stick to three o'clock in the afternoon. And of course, if any of you uh, in the audience here are Swedish researchers uh, interested in holding a events such as this with us. Of course, you're free to contact me either on Twitter or at my email address written here. We should also have that in the invitations to this event. Uh, so thank you. And again, you can find us on Twitter. Now I'm going to end the recording and I'm going to make it possible for everyone to uh, turn on the cameras and microphones and we'll get to see you guys as well.